As far as the supercars of this series, the vast majority of the ones that we've looked at tend to be more so obscure because they just didn't necessarily achieve anything unique enough to be remembered, or were just obscure because barely any were made and the companies couldn't really afford to either produce more or market them well enough. Sometimes though you have cars which are truly not just obscure, but they're really weird. They're just oddball cars. And of course I'm a huge proponent of oddball vehicles, I love cars that stand out, but even for me there are some cars that might go too far. Now for many people that's probably not the case here, but for me this has always been a car that I'm not quite sure what I think about, and that is the Tramontana. Now some of you guys will probably have heard of this car, it has been featured in some places like Evo Magazine and Fifth Gear on TV, but it doesn't tend to get a huge amount of exposure. The car is actually a Spanish supercar. And there aren't exactly many of those, so that in itself is pretty cool. Now the concept for the Tramontana is a fusion of formula car and fighter jet. And for sure, you can definitely see those influences there. I think if I were the head of marketing for Tramontana though, I might have said something more along the lines of the Grand Prix grid of 2010 had the rulebook been designed by Koenigsegg. Because that, to me, is what this car looks like. It's got some very Zenvo, Spiker, Pagani, Koenigsegg kind of vibes. Even the two-tone black and gold of the Tramontana R edition is again very reminiscent of some of those companies which also have that very extreme eye-popping colour combination with a crazy unique underpinning to its essential shape. And that's exactly what the Tramontana has. Now if you cut away all of the fancy stuff like the wings and the livery if you will and the long stalk again Zonda-esque wing mirrors and just look at the essential shape, it's an interesting one. And without all of those excesses and if you take off the roof, to me it actually looks very similar to a Grinnell Scorpion which of course is a car that came out much, much earlier. Now this car is considerably more extreme though <laughs> than a Grinnell Scorpion is, that's for sure. The price tag alone is up there with what the SLR McLaren and Porsche Carrera GT were when they were new, over £300,000. Now the concept for the car originated in 2005, it was first shown back then, and then they started production of 12 cars per year maximum each of which were built completely to order, custom built, even in terms of size of the interior, around that owner. So that every car was truly purpose built. And that as a concept is very cool. Of course it means that the company could never really apply for stuff like any kind of world record because it wouldn't be a production car. But at the end of the day, they probably weren't too worried about that. Now I think one of the reasons why I've always been a bit lukewarm on the Tramontana, even though I have actually seen one in real life at Goodwood, is because for all of its crazy appearance and its admittedly very impressive spec, it's got a 5.5 litre Mercedes V12 twin turbo over 700 horsepower and over 800 pound feet of torque, all of which are very impressive, but the performance just doesn't keep up with the numbers. The 0 to 60 time is 3.6 seconds. That doesn't sound that great compared to the power that it's got, and neither does the limited top speed of 201 miles per hour. Now why they chose to speed limit it to that I don't really know, maybe for safety reasons, maybe the aerodynamics become a bit more unstable at that speed, but I wouldn't have thought so. So that seems like a bit of a strange thing to do, to go out of your way to have that kind of power plant and then not really to fully use it. Again, very Pagani-esque, combining Mercedes power with that more, well, of course not Italian in this case, but Spanish design flair. And in its essential concept, I love it when countries and companies do that. Now, across the board, there have been different versions of the Tramontana. The original, mostly seen in silver, very simple, clean shape. It doesn't have the huge wings and the fancy colour scheme and all of that, and it just allows you to see what the essential idea behind the car is from a design point of view. And after that initial concept in 2005, they started production in 2007. Now, to reach production at all is a very impressive thing. For a tiny company to actually make their car happen, that's... Uh, it's nothing to be taken lightly. There are so many that don't get even that far, be it because people weren't interested enough, or the company wasn't well established enough, or didn't have the funds, but they actually managed to make it happen. Then in 2009, they released the black and gold Tramontana R edition. And then in 2012, they released probably my least liked of them all, the so-called 
Tramontana XTR, which is often seen in white. It has considerably different visuals. The lights at the front have gone from bug-eyed to kind of Caparo T1 style, sort of. And the car itself looks, again, more extreme, but I think in the case of this car, it didn't really need to be more extreme. It was already extreme enough. It's kind of like if you draw a picture of a supercar as a child and just keep adding things to it, doesn't necessarily make it better, and for me that's kind of how I feel with the Tramontana. Now the performance on the XTR is a little more vague, but presumed of course to be even quicker than the R version. Then again, is that really saying much, given how fast the Tramontana R was? Who knows? But it's not slow, don't get me wrong, it's just not quite as quick as you'd probably assume a car like this would be. And part of that is due to, interestingly enough, the same issue that another car that looks very similar to this in its essential concept, a supercar called the Holm Can-Am, and also the Holm F1. Those cars are also very clearly inspired by Formula One tech and Formula One drivers in the case of those, but they also weigh a lot more than they look. They're like 1150 kilo cars, which kind of neuters the whole advantage that this type of vehicle would usually have, because the beauty of something like a Grenoble Scorpion, which incidentally and somewhat ironically is faster than this car to 60, it can do it in 2.9, the beauty of those is they don't need a huge amount of power because they are so light. So to kind of reverse that and have, yes, a huge amount of power, but also a massive amount of weight to lug around, it almost undercuts the whole concept of why this car could have been, in my opinion, so brilliant. And that fact can be highlighted very easily by looking at how good the Caparo T1 is. It's insanely fast. Now, I'm not saying this needed to do exactly what Caparo did. That car, of course, has its own downsides to deal with, but they could have had some kind of medium between the two, something which definitely weighed less than this one does. That's for sure. This is over a 1,200 kilo car. That's a lot for this kind of design. Now, it is a two-seater, and it's actually a fairly big car, physically speaking, but the seats are two in tandem rather than next to each other, which, again, is reminiscent of some other cars in the open wheel sports car market but again a big disadvantage working against this car is it has a lot of the things which much cheaper cars can also offer that's kind of undercutting the whole concept now of course somebody with this kind of money would rather have something that can stand out and be unique and this car is certainly that so i'm not saying that it's a bad vehicle in any way by any means it's available with both v10 and v12 engines the v10 is far less powerful it's got around 650 horsepower, whereas the top of the line XTR has 888. So it's impressive as far as the numbers across the board. It's very impressive, in fact. But I don't know. There's just something about the Tramontana which never quite did it for me. It's wacky, but without trying to hate on the car too much, it almost feels to me like it's trying too hard in a weird kind of way. Maybe that's just me. But either way, it is definitely a car which, down to nothing else but its determination to make the concept work, does deserve to be talked about more. As it happens, it wasn't a failure completely, as many of the other cars were, it actually did manage to accomplish what it set out for, and that in itself makes it worthy of talking about in my book. As it happens, it's also unique, it's wacky, it's oddball, and for the right person, the right driver, the right buyer, it would certainly be appealing. And it's funny for me because usually a car like this would appeal to me, but on this occasion, for various reasons, this one just doesn't as much. Overall, though, that's it for this pick. Of course, you can check out all of the previous episodes with all kinds of crazy and weird cars that we've talked about as well by clicking through here at the end. But for now, as always, thanks for watching. 